Welcome. You're listening to Women's Health and Beyond with Dr. David Goslin, the only podcast for women providing a physician's point of view on everything relating to women's health, sexual medicine, and cosmetic gynecology. Get ready to discover the latest and hottest topics in women's health and how they relate to you. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in for today's episode where Dr. David Goslin discusses everything to do with a labioplasty procedure. First of all, just, just to set the audience straight, we have to be clear that when you discuss labioplasty, you actually have to say which labias, because you can be operating on the labia minoras, which are your inner lips, and the labia majora, which are your outer lips. And those are two separate techniques and two separate procedures. In your case, Lauren, you had a labioplasty menorah, mm-hmm. which typically is the most common. Mm-hmm. And in the demographics is usually the most common in my younger patients, right? Because labia majora plasties is usually due because there, you start seeing some sagging and wrinkling around the labia majora, the outer uh, labias. And that's usually because there's a fat loss, a, vo- a volume of fat that's lost over time. Mm-hmm. And that happens to everybody. So we want to hear about your experience and 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 you and I can maybe even play through how it a procedure down. goes like yeah. because it's done under local so patient comes in we take pictures and and maybe you can give us your experience on on what it felt like to be injected with a small needle in your labia I mean that's pretty terrifying Yeah a um, uh, bee sting A bee sting Yeah A bee sting If you're going to perform aesthetic GYN surgery on women you have to understand or have a good handle on the psychological factors that influence aesthetic surgery. Because you don't want to operate, and I'm not saying you, but you don't want to operate on somebody with body dysmorphism, which can be a real big problem uh, and a very real thing that happens in, in, in the world where somebody comes in and they perceive themselves as being a completely different image than they truly are. Mm -hmm. And no matter how often or how well you operate on them, nothing's going to improve it. Totally. And that becomes a a vicious cycle. I can't tell you how many people come in. They've unfortunately have gone through a difficult time in a relationship. Maybe the the intimacy factor was not there during their relationship. And maybe they're self-blaming. And so they're coming in looking for a, a quick fix. It's also just wanting to feel new. Wanting a fresh start. So, Lauren, just to give you a little, because I love the fact that, you know, I can come from a little bit more of the conservative and medical and boring, but I think it's important to bring that up. Um, I think that what you're saying is is super valid and makes total sense, and, and I think we can all appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not the only reason people get labioplasties. Right. And I just want to, I want to talk to you about some of those things because I think it's important for people in our audience who are maybe questioning whether they need one, um, what are some of the things that I hear in my practice? Yeah. So just so you know, I mean, the whole new factor is is real and true. And, and listen, did it work for you? Yes. Did you feel like you felt like a new start? Yeah. Totally. 100%. And that's great because you are already mentally and emotionally ready for that new start. And I think that's really important to bring up. It wasn't just a physical change. I think emotionally, that was just sort of you know, the end point for you. Right. And, and, and so you were able to move on from there. Um, asymmetry is very important. Um, it's, it's very common that one labia is much longer or different or thicker or thinner than another one. And for some women, like you said in our last podcast, you've seen lots of women naked. Well, they see you naked. And so if you're sitting in a locker room at school or talking to your best friend and you're noticing that why does my labias look so different than everybody else's? Or some some high school kid that you're making out with or in college says, oh my God, I've never seen labias like this. And I hear this. And this psychologically scars people and it hurts. And it brings up all these raw emotions. And so they come in and they're like, look, I've been, I didn't even know this existed. But since I've been 17 and somebody told me I had quote unquote roast beef labia, I've been wanting and, and to do this. Can you please help me? And if I go back to that academic first episode we talked about, mm-hmm. well, I'm really sorry, Lauren, this is within the normal range and I don't think you need surgery. That's a bunch of BS because 
my goal as, as a physician is to treat you and help you. Sometimes I'm going to help you because there's an actual medical reason or conditioning I'm, or condition I'm helping you with. And sometimes I'm helping you even in normal anatomy situations because it's fine. There's nothing wrong with having asymmetry of a labia. There's nowhere in any textbook, in any oral or written board exam, that's going to say that there is abnorm abnormality associated with one labia being longer. But emotionally, maybe there is. And, and then the rhetoric is going to be, well, she's 17 years old. Why would you operate on a 17-year-old? Well, I get the same thing from a 30-year-old attorney who comes to my office, who's well-educated, understands herself, is her psyche is normal, and she tells me she wants the same procedure done. And so I think we have to kind of get this um, nonsense taboo word that it's if, if we're going to do breast augmentations, if we're going to allow liposuction without, without thinking twice, if it's okay and totally permissible for men and women to enhance their lips or put implants in, whether it's in your breasts, in your calves, in, in your arms, to, or, or, or to add fat to your butt, there's nothing wrong with changing the way you feel in your genitals. As a matter of fact, I think that's a very powerful thing for intimacy. Mm -hmm. Because how often do I hear that I'm embarrassed to turn on the lights when I'm in, I'm being intimate with my boyfriend because I don't want him to see me down there. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if that happened to you before you had the surgery. Of course. I also experienced pinching when I would wear jeans. I was going to bring that up. Yep. And it was uncomfortable. So aside from the way that it looked, it also wasn't super comfy. Sure. My underwear would pinch me and it was just, it was. Bathing suits. So yeah, you know, it like. You, Having to retuck. It's a thing, especially if the swimsuit is very thin mm -hmm. and you can sort of see the outline or you get wet. There is an image out there that is perceived. And then there's a reality that most women have. And that's why I think there's this crossroads of why is it different? And because I'm different, I'm not OK. Totally. And so I think we've brought up a lot of good points on why women desire to have a labioplasty. I think it's a lot of it is physical. It's uncomfortable. Um, intimately, maybe a little bit embarrassing in their eyes, um, even though it's not a reality. Mm -hmm. um, asymmetric, longer than, than, than what they feel is normal. Um, but I want to also talk, before we get into the actual procedure, mm -hmm. I want to give you guys a little bit of the history behind all this stuff. Yeah. So... You know, labiaplasty hasn't been around. I mean, look, it's probably been around for a very, very long time, but it hasn't really been popular or made popular all that long. Um, you know, when I started doing it um, in 2005, the chairman at St. John's Hospital in Santa Monica, and he said, I want to talk to you. So, you know, he praised me a little bit, said, listen, you're a great guy. People like you in the hospital. Compliment I think you've sandwich. Got compliment sandwich. But he said, I checked out your website which was a 2005 version of a website I remember how short the pages were and all that stuff <laughs> yeah. and he said what is this what is this stuff you're doing labioplasty he goes I listen he goes I, I want you to do me a favor I want you to go home take that and I'm, I'm gonna quote him because I'm not saying who it is I'm gonna I want you to take that shit off of your website and I never want to see it again because you're gonna ruin your reputation if you want to be in this town for a long time you have to allow yourself to be perceived in a certain way. And doing labioplasties is going to destroy your reputation. And I really went home and I had to really ponder, man, do I, maybe I was wrong. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't go down this path. And I ended up going down this path in the first place because a friend of mine just a year prior came to me and the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology wanted to write an opinion statement on this new procedure called labioplasty. And he called me up and he said, Dave, I, my chairman at Cedars wants me to write this. I don't have time. He was doing a fellowship at the time. He said, what do you think if you and I co-write this opinion together? And I said, well, I don't know. And I've never heard of, I mean, I know what a labioplasty is in the remedial sense, but I don't really know anything about it. And at that time, very few people were doing it. And I actually took a, from there, I went and did a, a mini fellowship with my mentor and that's how I learned about it. And so I went home after that chairman spoke to me, and it took about a week. And I said, screw this. I'm not, I'm not going to take this off. I really believe that this can help a lot of people, and I really think it's going to become a lot more popular. Uh, maybe four years ago, um, I get the same phone call, 
and I get the, would you mind teaching me a labioplasty? No. And that's how the perception of cosmetic GYN has changed so much over the years. So people, you know, I've done, I've done a lot of interviews for articles and, 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 uh, and a little bit of film. And when people ask me, well, is it pornography? Is it the internet that sort of brought all this to the surface? And look, 100%, right? I mean, 20 years ago, if you want to learn a labioplasty, you have to go to the library and go through the index cards to find an article written about a labioplasty. And now, you know, high school kids in the ninth grade are no more than I do about labioplasties. But the reality is maybe maybe the way, you know, maybe we shave everything today. And so everything is much more apparent. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there's so many reasons why labioplasties have become popular. We talk about it. It's not taboo anymore. Um, And so I think that the freedom of being able to express your insecurities today is a lot less than it was a decade ago. And I think we should really cherish that. I want to caution the audience that what I'm going to talk about, the procedure today, unfortunately the traditional general gynecologist as well-trained and as amazing, I'm sure your physician is, I can almost guarantee you does not do a labioplasty well. And you have one shot at doing a labioplasty or else it's called a revision and you never want to do a revision. So I always urge patients when I write blogs that they need to do their homework and find somebody who has a lot of experience. Because even me, look, unfortunately when I started in 05, my skills were nowhere near where they are today. I mean, for me, I, I do, you know, four or five of these a week. And so I know the little nuances. I know the tricks. I, I've invented some of the tricks myself. Um, and so experience is really key. Um, there's a lot of different techniques. Um, and I think that what makes a good labioplasty doctor is not being rigid-minded and keeping an open focus on what the patient is looking for. It's always nice when they come in with pictures. Unfortunately, Lauren, you brought up the fact that they look at porn and, and, and they see a vision of what a vagina looks like and they want me to duplicate it. And I have to take the mirror, as I do always, and show them this is what you look like and I promise you're not going to look like that picture no matter what I do. And so you really have to set the expectations correctly and I think that's very important in any aesthetic procedure because if not, you're, you're really asking for people to have unrealistic expectations of what a surgery or a procedure can do. So I think it's huge that you say that too, because um, I didn't know that gynecologists did a labiaplasty. I thought a plastic surgeon did a labiaplasty. And that's who I started searching first when I was online. I'm like, plastic <clears throat> surgery for the vagina. That was what I typed in because I didn't know what it was called. I didn't know what I wanted. Totally. So, and, and you bring up a great point. So traditionally when this first started, who was doing it? Plastic surgeons? It was actually invented by a gynecologist. Hence the field of cosmetic gynecology. Here's a gynecologist like me who has been trained entirely in the pelvis. And that's really important because, look, I don't do, I don't do breast. I don't do bellies. I don't do... Anything unless it's in the pelvis. Mm-hmm. And the reason is because if I were to operate on you, Lauren, and you had a complication, I feel super comfortable treating that complication because that's second nature for me. Right. You know, I've spent years of my life operating in the vagina. So, it, although that may sound a little boring, um, but the reality is a plastic surgeon hasn't. Right. He's maybe done it a few times in his residency. But he has an aesthetic eye. He has the finesse. That's very important that the gynecologist may not have. And so the question is, your your intuition of looking for a plastic surgeon, I think, was really correct because you wanted to have a really good outcome that was very natural looking, that was beautiful. You wanted a beautiful, natural looking change. Mm -hmm. So why not a plastic surgeon? Well, why not a gynecologist that has emphasis on aesthetics? And that's where I think you bring in the two worlds, and that's where you get the best outcome. I didn't know that you performed them until I talked to you about it. Because I remember I did all my research online. I didn't even think to look up a gynecologist because I thought that you worked on the inside, not the outside. And I remember talking to you about it the first time. And you told me that you often would prefer 
perform that surgery on someone who had just delivered a baby? No, never. Oh. So let me just Where clarify that? that. So I never, ever, 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 ever perform any aesthetics on somebody who just delivers a, a baby because you're really swollen and edematous during your pregnancy. And so you have the tissue swells. Right. And so you are going to, in your own words, you potentially could butcher somebody hmm. because if you're swollen and once the swelling goes down, I, it, it would throw everything. It would not be balanced. What about after they have a baby like a year or two down the road? Yeah. So a few months down the road, no problem. Is that, is, I'm just wondering where I got that from. Was the, is that something that women. You probably heard of the daddy stitch. So somebody like the big joke is my husband told the gynecologist to put an extra stitch or two. Have you heard that, Jeff? Oh, yeah. No? To make it's called the good. daddy stitch. And so, and to make you a little tighter, right? And actually, I, I, I actually have been quoted in, in, in certain magazines talking about this. And you can look it up. That also is complete myth, 100% pure myth. There is no way you can do a correct vaginal tightening surgery. When a baby just comes out, there's all this blood. It's not the right time. You need to, you know, when you're doing a correct, the difference is when I do a vaginal plasty, a vaginal tightening surgery, I'm really taking my time to dissect the right planes, put everything back together um, as carefully and as aesthetically as I possibly can. And, and you can't do that with a crying baby, a, a room full of nurses, mom and dad there, all this stuff that's coming out of your vagina, your placenta, the afterbirth, the blood that follows. It's just, I mean, not not to the same definition of what I would call a good, true vaginal tightening surgery. That's our first myth that first we have myth debunked. just debunked. Yes. I love that. Mic drop. We just did it. We just did the first one. I love that. Podcast episode number official one, Myth Debunked, the Daddy Stitch. Let's talk about the procedure. Yeah. Let's talk about you. So you came in. We did a consultation. We talked about what your hopes were. Mm -hmm. And then I, I probably put a mirror, like I just said, right? Mm -hmm. And you and I looked at it together. Yep. And I what I typically like to do during my office visit when we're doing this consultation is I will use... Um, usually a, a Q-tip, a laboratory Q-tip, to fold the labias over to show you what I think it, it should look like. Uh -huh. Just to let your audience know, there's a lot of different final looks that are labeled out there, the rim, the Barbie look. I am a big, big, big fan of leaving a little bit of labia behind because I do think that there is a protective effect of the labia in protecting and causing closure of the opening of the vagina. There's a lot of people striving for that Barbie look um, invented by a good friend of mine, um, which may have some merit in some people. For the most part, I always tell patients, and if you're seeking an, a, 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 a labioplasty and you're having a consultation, please take my advice when I tell you. People want everything off because they've lived with long labias their whole lives, and so they want that drastic change. And I always tell everybody, do me a favor. Let me not take as much off as you think you want me to take off, unless I think it's the right amount. But if you're really going for that almost Barbie look, I always really advise the patients before they go for that final Barbie look to allow me to leave a little bit of labia behind because I can always take off more, but I can never give you back. And Barbie doesn't even have a vagina. I know. You know, there's not even a slit there. There's... I, I, I don't remember playing with Barbies. It's been a very long time, so I, I can't comment on that one. I think that's what I was going for, too. I was like, I want to look like Barbie. And you said the same thing to me. You were like, I'm going to leave a little bit behind. And I trusted you. And I think that that's a really important part. Besides going to someone that's just you, that knows really what they're doing, there it has to be that level of trust. Similar to, I feel like this kind of coincides with a boob job. Women who've been flat chested forever just want to go straight to a double D. They just want the biggest change ever because they've had a flat chest for so long. Not everybody, but that's like a pretty common thing. They want to go from something they haven't had to something that's very present. So I feel like that was the same thing for me. I was like, just cut it all off. 
And I didn't even know what the procedure was or how it was performed until you told me. But I was super stoked when you told me that it was a local procedure, that I didn't have to go through anesthesia. Honestly, that sold me. I was like super excited about that because I don't want to go to a hospital. I didn't want to be put under anesthesia. That also cost a lot more money. And I wanted to have something that wasn't going to just be breaking my bank account that I could get a result and just be awake. Honestly, I don't like anesthesia. So, yeah, I mean, look, I probably do 95% of all our procedures when it comes to labioplasty is under local anesthesia, but that's not how it started. It really started in the hospital because I felt in the very beginning when I first started Look, I, you know, there's a little bit of bleeding involved and I feel more comfortable being in a hospital setting. But you know what happened in the hospital? Super expensive because most of the time there is no insurance coverage because insurances are going to turn around and say, within the normal range, she doesn't need surgery, right? Although I'm going to tell you that that's such bull because they pay for circumcisions and baby boys don't need to be circumcised. They just do it because it's cultural, or because their dad's circumcised. But, what a good point. But that's, we'll, we can get into that. Still. But good point. really, really what pissed me off in the hospital was, and this was a long time ago, was the taboo factor, right? So Lauren comes out of the operating room, and I operate in operating room three, and she goes to the recovery room. And the, the nurse, I get a phone call, or I can hear the nurse while I'm writing my notes saying to the other nurse, she just had a labioplasty. And then, and then, and then, a lot of things like that's so weird. Can you believe that? Are you serious? Yeah, there was so, gossiping. Not about you, but I'm, no, I'm in using the you, but, hospital. But yes, like, of course, just you know. Was, I'm, I'm, and, and look, and these part are of this nurses. Poca- part of this podcast is me telling you guys my my vision of of and me seeing it through my eyes as a surgeon and living through it. And so I was seeing these patients pay a lot of money for the hospital fees. I was seeing disrespect going on within the medical community and procedures I was being performed. And I had already heard of people starting to do these in the office. Brought my first few patients in the office, um, and today we do almost all our patients. Matter of fact, the amount of anesthesia I use has maybe re- been reduced by a quarter of what I used to be able to u- what I used to use before because I learned better techniques of utilizing the amount of anesthesia. So we're minimizing the amount of drugs we're giving you. You're not having to pay for the cost of having extra personnel in the room Mm -hmm. because you have to have an anesthesiologist. You have to have scrub tech. You have to have nurse circulating nurses, recovery room nurses. And so tremendous savings for the patient. So much more comfortable. My patients watch a movie. I mean, there's a nice flat screen. You turn on your favorite Netflix show and watch, you know, and I actually, thanks to them, I come home and that's what I want to watch. So I've been listening to, um, like the other day, somebody was playing the, the TV show You. And so I came home and I told my wife, have you heard of You? <laughs> I, I was doing this labioplasty. It sounded so good. And I mean, not like I'm watching it. It's behind me. Yeah. But the point is I'm trying to give the audience this idea that it's not scary anymore. Yeah. Uh, people are sitting there completely comfortable. It is a bee sting in the beginning, although I do use numbing cream uh, ahead of time that we let sit to, to sort of take the edge off. And then we numb. So the way I do it is this. Lauren comes in. You and I have our consultation. You decide the day of surgery. You come in. We sign consents. I, we take pictures. You and I, I always take pictures. Um, we go over the pictures. And then once the pictures are done, I take a surgical marking pen because I'm not a true artist. And I just simply draw my labias. So I know exactly what to do. I know it's not, And I'm kidding. It's not about being a true artist. It's because once I inject you with anesthesia, it, de- it defigures the tissue, and I don't really know where my planes are, so I have to mark it ahead of time. Um, so once that happens, um, I use I personally use a device called an Elman Surgitron, which is a radio frequency tip that's about the size of your hair follicle, so I can really get in there and really be able to, in, in, in a very minuscule way, change and shape the labials the way I want to. Uh, the procedure takes me about an hour to do. I close it in several layers, so that, we, you know, just in case a suture falls off, which can happen, unless it's the worst place to have surgery in the world. Um, and the sutures are self-dissolvable. But you tell me now, I mean, the day of your surgery, do you remember it? Yeah. Are you traumatized <laughs> by it? <laughs> 
do I remember the day my labia got lasered off? Yeah, but more because I was excited. Um, I was really, I had been wanting to do it for years. Years I had wanted to do a labiaplasty. Again, didn't know it existed. And the time had finally come that it was right to do. So I walked into the office and I was like, yes, here we go. And I knew that I was going to walk out feeling really good about what I had done. And I trusted you. So I was, I had full confidence, but I, I remember uh, the numbing cream and the bee sting shot. And I think that's what I remembered the most was the bee sting shot. Cause I was like, <sighs> it was a deep breath in. And I was like, whoo, woof. And then, um, but luckily you're fast. You're, you know, you, you, some nurses can like give you a shot in the arm and it's very slow. That was not it. It was like, Boom, and it was over. And then after that, it's the Bruce Lee technique. Oh man, you One, were. Two. Whoops. And so after the bee sting, um, I think you gave me a Xanax. And before, I, yeah, yeah, to calm <clears throat> down. By the way, you always need a driver. Yeah. So Lauren had a driver. I never let anybody Uber it, lift it, or taxi it home without a driver. Yeah, I had a driver. My driver had my back. Um, but yeah, I took a Xanax. Beasting happened, and then I put in headphones, and I watched a TV show on my phone, <laughs> and I was laying on my back, so I was holding the phone up above my head, and I was just watching it pretty much, and then I remember I did that because I just didn't want to hear, because you the, li the little surgical thing you have, I think, makes a noise, yeah. and so I'm just very, I just wanted to block out everything and just not know what was going on, um, and then like 45 minutes later, it was over. And then you told me that I had some stitches and then I just, I had a numbing cream that I put on them and I, and I iced it a little bit and I, for like a while, I think like a week. And then after like the first week was the worst, uh, because it would bleed a little bit. It would swell. It was, it was painful, you know, but it's like anything you have surgery on. And so I, it wasn't like I was shocked. I was just something I had to deal with. And then once the stitches fell out, I think I, uh, how long was it? Like no sex. It was like a little over two months, but I was also freshly divorced. So I wasn't dating anybody. So I had a good long time to heal. I did, that was never my thing, but there is some downtime of not being intimate. And I think that's something that a lot of the girls that I told about it, they're like, oh, how long could you not have sex? And I was like, well, I didn't have sex for a while just cause I wasn't seeing anybody, but I think you have to wait like eight weeks and they were all like, oh, because oh, a lot of God. them have either boyfriends or. So, so let me, can I clarify a couple of things? Yeah. Before I forget. So I think you nailed almost everything, but a little bit in the wrong order. So I just want to make sure the audience gets it clear. Yeah. So Lauren's absolutely right. Um, the surgery takes about 45 minutes to an hour after I'm, and everybody's different. So, I mean. Oh, I also had my clitoral hood. Oh, right. And we can talk about clitoral hood reductions. Redu reduced. But. Sutures do self dissolve. I don't recommend you put numbing cream on right away. I, I usually don't think I, I, do. I usually recommend that we use that a few days after it's it really burns. Icing is super duper important. I really recommend Motrin. So you guys, if you're not doing the surgery with me, usually I recommend you start Motrin 24 hours before. It's an anti inflammatory. I do recommend Arnica. I usually give that away in my goodie bag. I give you I, everybody gets a goodie bag in my office. They get a peri bottle to spray. So when you go to the bathroom, you can spray. Mm -hmm. You get pads. I usually recommend wet your pads, put them in the freezer. That's the best ice bag you'll ever have. Um, or frozen peas, just don't serve them later on for dinner. <laughs> um, um, and then the numbing cream comes a few days later. And that first week that Lauren discussed that it really hurt, I call it my Frankenstein period. And I, I tell everybody that everybody's going to look as soon as they get home of for course. the most part. You want to put that mirror there. But I tell everybody, it's the Frankenstein week for the first week. If you're going to look at it, you're going you're gonna to depress yourself because it's not like having elbow surgery. It touches everything. So every time you walk, you sit, you, you, you rub, you put on clothes, it's rubbing against my suture line, and so it gets swollen. Mm -hmm. And so I get, the tissue actually swells. It looks angry for a long time. And then over time, it slowly unswells, and then it looks a lot better. Sutures dissolve typically around week three. I use a special suture called a Rapide, which dissolves faster. <clears throat> Sex is usually at six weeks, not eight, but sometimes, you know, 
I always tell people you, I give you the green light, so I don't put a, a true number on it. It's also like you kind of don't even want to. Like, I mean, there's no appeal in having sex either, so it's not. I don't. I don't even think that that's like a. Because afterwards, you want it to be the whole reason that you do the procedure is because you want it to be prettier than it was. So and to feel more comfortable with the lights on. So you really do this procedure kind of makes you go through the process so that you can get there. And that's the whole point of it. So I don't even think it was that hard. Once you do it, you're just in it for the till it's healed and pretty. At least that's my opinion. Well, that's you, but for maybe a lot of people <laughs> or at least I get told you're like they, other they, people have relationships. I get phone calls from the boyfriends, how much longer? Twenty four hours? You promise? Just twenty four hours, right? Um but, you know, talking about speed of recovery, before I forget, uh, first of all, I want to draw back one more thing. There's not just one technique in doing a labioplasty. There's actually several techniques. I don't know that we can truly go into them, but there's a curved linear technique where um, you take off the edges. A lot of times there's brown pigmentation or darker pigmentation on the labias at the very edges. There's also a lot of times some some wrinkling at the end of the labias. And so if, if people don't like that, I like to do a curved linear Sometimes if they want to re- keep that external look the same so that they're happy with the pigmentation, they're happy with that very natural look of their natural labias, then we do a wedge resection, um, and that allows me to keep the outside contour the same. <clears throat> That's something you should definitely discuss with the surgeon you plan on doing it, or if you do it with me, that we can discuss. And people always ask me, which is better? Mm-hmm. And I always tell them the same thing. Neither one is better. What's better is the experience your surgeon has using that technique. Mm-hmm. And so and so, if your surgeon feels more comfortable and does a lot more curved linear surgery, then that's the technique you should use and not the wedge and vice versa. Some wedge prefers don't do curved linear and they should do their wedge. But there's a brand new technology that I'm actually demoing tomorrow morning. I have two demo patients tomorrow, patients of mine that are coming in to, to do this demo with me. I'm super excited about it. It's going to be a non-surgical labioplasty. Imagine this. We, we've been talking and focusing on the fact that it hurts, mm-hmm. that you can't have sex for eight weeks, that it swells, that it's the, the Frankenstein, Frankenstein look. And now I'm telling you that there there is a new procedure out that I'm going to be the first in Los Angeles to probably perform tomorrow morning that's going to be a non-surgical labioplasty where we're using radio frequency laser with an internal probe. So I'm going to take this... It looks like almost like a, a very tiny pencil, metallic pencil that I'm going to insert into the labia, actually. And I'm going to shrink the labia from the inside with the heat. And I'm super excited about it because if that's the case, if Lauren, you're my patient tomorrow. You get up, say thanks very much, and I'm going to get back to work because I have a 2 o'clock appointment. And then when you see your boyfriend the next day, you... Going to turn on the lights and be as intimate as you want and not have to worry because there's really very little recovery to it. Now, the big caveat is does it work for every labia? I think that it has to be a certain size. I don't know if it's really enlarged, if it's going to make enough of a difference. But for a lot of people, it's going to be amazing. Wow. Yeah, so I'm super excited. and We talked a lot about labioplasties today. I yeah. Mean, I think we've really sort of gotten into the meat and, and, and understanding the nuts and bolts of how what happens. Again, just some take-home points for all you guys. Please, please, please find an experienced surgeon. I think that's really important. If it's a, if it's a, if it's a plastic surgeon that does a lot of labioplasties, awesome. If it's a gynecologist that does a lot of them, awesome. But experience is key. Um, be realistic with your expectations. I think it's super important. Yeah. Um, making sure that you get a really good post-op instruction kit. All our patients go home with a multi, you know, it's a it's a, a packet of, of the do's and not to do's on, on, on and, and the sequence of doing things. We give you guys a goodie bag to make your life, a goodie bag to make people's lives a little easier. Um, no smoking. Super important. Smoking is awful for recovery from surgery. Uh, make sure you... And just in general. And just in general, yeah. Like maybe just stop smoking altogether. New vagina, new you, new lungs. Let's just not smoke. I like that, I, I, I really promote no smoking. <laughs> Agreed. 
Good question. Question raised about the cost. Look, cost is everywhere. Everywhere in the United States may be a little bit different. I think also the experience of your surgeon plays a role in cost. Uh, but I would say in Los Angeles, because that's my familiar territory, cost is probably anywhere between 3000 to 6500 Yeah, I had, um, I didn't even know that I needed this done, but I had my clitoral hood. Yes, we did your clitoral to, hood. And I didn't even know what that was. Again, I was kind of walking into it a little bit blind because I was like, I don't know what I need, but this is what I want. And then you were like, oh, this is what we can do. So... Why? I think I just had too much skin, and then we took some of it off. Is that what happened? So, as far as your labia minoris are concerned, usually it's just elongated skin, or and making things more symmetrical, right. uh, reducing the size, clitoral hood. You know, your your body makes everything symmetrical. So, if you've got enlarged labias, for the most part, you probably have a a much broader hood, a, a bigger clitoral hood. And I always tell patients, look, if I'm going to make your labias really thin and small and you've got this thicker, broader clitoral hood, I call it the, the bird beak look. It becomes really prominent on top. And so it's really, you don't have to address it at the time, but it's something you may want to keep in mind if, it, if, if it's if not If you're going to go look. through the procedure, just do it. Because you're there, you're doing it. Just do it. By the way, that same laser I'm telling you about also helps with clitoral hood reductions. Awesome. So I had that done too. Um, yeah, but I, I, I can't attest to the difference in recovery or anything, but it doesn't even matter. You have a new laser coming through. So that, that laser is going to be amazing for so many people. And again, I love having this podcast too, because you're offering help and you're, you're telling that women that there's this procedure out there and it's not that expensive because they, and, or there's no downtime, which is really amazing too. I think that's just a beautiful thing. Um, and you guys, I know that Dr. Gosland is too modest and he's not going to tell you to just go to him, but I'm not. I think that if you're in Southern California, I mean, people travel for plastic surgery all the time. And if this is something that you really want to do and you, something you've been thinking about and you, uh, want to go to someone that has a ton of experience, I highly recommend Dr. Gosland. Um, his info is going to be everywhere. You'll be able to find him. He's in Brentwood. So I I recommend that if you can, to seek him out and have a consultation because he might just be right for you too. Thanks, Lauren. Of course. And I appreciate it. And if you guys have questions, I mean, we have to find a way to and be able to answer some of these questions. Yeah, yeah. We're going to have some social media channels that you can find us on. Slide in our DMs and ask some questions. Um, in the in future episodes, we're going to have call-ins. We're going to let people call in and ask questions. If you don't feel comfortable calling in, you can always be anonymous. You can also uh, send us a message through one of the social media platforms and just say that you'd like some questions answered and we'll be happy to address that on this show too. That's what we're all about is giving the help and answering questions that people are sometimes too afraid to ask. So thank you guys again for tuning in. We really appreciate it. Dr. Gosland, any last thoughts? Please don't be embarrassed to talk about this topic. If it's something that affects you emotionally and I always tell people we are blessed to live in a, in a world that has a lot of solutions to a lot of problems Take advantage of it. Find 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 the right people. Get it done. Make your life better. It's a new year. And um, I'm happy to discuss this further with you. Feel free to reach out to me personally. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We will see you next time. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of Women's Health and Beyond with Dr. David Goslin. If you found this episode informative, be sure to subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to ask Dr. Goslin a question, please visit our website at www.davidgoslin.com or connect on all social media platforms at David Goslin. We'll see you next week for another episode.